Right now, we got Mike, My, Mike Fontanova. He's going to be bringing, he's one of our pastors here, discipleship pastors. He's going to bring a message from Matthew 28, verse 1 through 7. We're going through Scripture. Reading Scripture, if you understand it, can change your life forever. So let's get ready. Let's give him a hand and let him know we're ready to receive from God. I got the mic. All right. How many love our pastor? Come on. He's amazing. So glad to have him back. Really grateful for this opportunity. We're going to pray and we're going to jump right into the word. Father, we just thank you for this amazing night. We thank you for what you're already doing in this room, for the way that you show up and you touch people's lives. We pray, God, that you would speak in this room tonight, that you would speak to our lives, that you would use your word as you always do to build faith to build our expectation, to give us instruction that we need. We ask for you to do what you want to do, and we give you this night. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you love the Wayworld Outreach and you love Jesus, just give him a shout. I'm super, super glad. I don't know about you guys, but there's one clear, very clear demonstration of God's love and grace to me, and it's the fact that he brought me to the Wayworld Outreach. I, I, could, I could spend a long time talking about what a miracle it is that God brought me here, but he brought us all together with one person that I, I really want to just give a moment to honor. That's our pastor, Pastor Marco Garcia and his wife, Lisa, that just came back. I can't wait to hear from them on Sunday. It's going to be amazing. They just came back from a vacation, so we know pastor's coming out full and ready to go. And pastor and his family have had such an a tremendous impact on my wife and my family, and I know that that's true for all of us in this room. And so if, you've, if you're thankful, would you just give God a round of applause that he has given us such an amazing pastor? I was talking with Pastor Marco uh, right before I came out tonight to share, and as he said, we're going to be studying the Bible tonight. And as we get into the Bible, there's, there's a couple of things you need to know about the Bible. The first is that in the Bible, God gives us instructions that help us to access blessings. And some people, there might be some people in the room tonight that are like, you know, I don't know if I'm living the blessed life. I I just want to propose, maybe you're not doing it right. Maybe there's some instructions that, that God has for you that you haven't yet implemented. Another thing that takes place in the Bible through God's word is that God will build our faith and our expectation. He will give us promises. He'll give us instructions. He'll give us uh, an an idea or vision for the future that builds our faith and gets us ready for the thing he wants to do. And tonight, we're going to look specifically to a very important part of the Bible. We're going to look at a part of the Bible that describes what Pastor and I would say is the most important event in history. The most important event in history. Now, we're not just going to talk about that event and the historical facts that surround it, but we're also going to talk about how that could have an impact on your life today. Do you understand that the Bible is one of the only, the only written pieces of literature in the world that can change you? that can literally transform your character, it can change your life, it can change your future, and it can change your eternity. And so when we jump into the Bible tonight, we're going to be looking at a passage that describes the most important event in history that's ever taken place, and it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection, that's a big fancy word. It's It means to be raised from the dead. If you look up the dictionary definition of the resurrection, it's referring specifically to the one and only man in history who has resurrected. Now, before you get upset, I want you to know there has been some people who have been resuscitated. They they died and Jesus resuscitated them. There's multiple examples of miracles where Jesus raised someone from the dead, but those people were raised to the same body that they had before they died, and they eventually passed away again. But Jesus is the only man in history to resurrect 
And when he resurrected, he was resurrected with a body like no one has ever seen, a resurrection body that could walk through walls, that had power that had never been seen in the world before. That's the resurrection we're talking about tonight. And that power that we're going to describe and we're going to look at should have an impact on you today. It can have an impact on your, on your today and your tomorrow, your future, if you will allow it to, if you'll respond to it, if you'll allow this word to change your life. Let me tell you about this moment in history before we jump into the story. You know, sometimes I think because we talk so much about faith and we talk about belief even when we can't understand and when we don't know the circumstances, sometimes I think people think that we have to do that with the story of Jesus and to some extent you have to take it on faith. But I want you to know that this event it's describing tonight is the most clearly historically documented event in history. There is no other event in history that has this level of documentation. We've got four eyewitnesses that wrote accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have additional eyewitness accounts from those that lived in this era, and we have external evidence that points to this amazing event, and it all confirms this one incredible truth that Jesus lived, that he really lived, he really died, and he really rose from the dead. That's not something you have to take on faith. It's a fact. Do you understand? Let me give you a couple quotes here. This is from Billy Grant. There is more evidence that Jesus rose from the dead than there is that Julius Caesar ever lived or that Alexander the Great died at the age of 33. Charles Spurgeon, another famous preacher, said this, the resurrection is a fact better attested than any event recorded in any history, whether ancient or modern. What are they talking about? Do you understand that there are manuscripts that describe certain stories in our history, but not one of those has anywhere near the number of manuscripts that describe Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. There are 5,800 manuscripts that all say the same thing. They all come from the same era, and they point to this one fact. Jesus really lived, he really died, and he really rose from the dead. It's crazy to me. There's no story like this because this is the most important event in history. And God wanted to make sure that it was in every one of our books, every one of our Bibles, so that we could understand the power that it has to change our lives today and tomorrow and forever. You know that Paul said this about the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 14. If Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. That's a strong statement. He's saying that if the resurrection didn't take place, everything we're saying is nonsense. He goes on to say, but since Christ did raise from the dead, we can stand in a place that we could never be without that power that was put on display. So tonight we're going to look at three truths from the resurrection that are going to impact your life, your today, and your eternity. Matthew chapter 28 Verses 1 through 7. I'm going to read them to you. Again, a moment in history. Not a fairy tale, not a fable. This is an event that took place about 2,000 years ago. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. Truth number one from the resurrection. The stone was rolled away. The stone was rolled away. Let me talk to you about this stone for a minute. It says in the verses just before our story tonight, just before this event took place, 
that the religious leaders went to Pilate, who had condemned Jesus to die, and they said, Sir, we remember that this man said he would raise from the dead in three days. Very interesting to note that the religious leaders remembered very well what Jesus said, but some of his disciples seemed to have forgotten. They went to Pilate, and it says in Matthew chapter 27, pick up where they left off after, uh, in verse 63, they said, after three days I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at the first. And Pilate replied, take the guards and secure it as best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. I want to talk about this stone. Do you understand that the stone that they placed in front of Jesus' tomb likely weighed somewhere between one to two tons. That's 2,000 to 4,000 pounds. Now, I know some of you guys have been working out with Humble Beast, and you guys got some big old muscles, but I don't think there's anybody in here that's going to be able to push 4,000 pounds around all by themselves. This was a stone that was humanly impossible to move. It would take multiple men to move this stone. It was big, it was heavy, and it was impossible for any one person to move. In addition, they placed a seal over this stone, over this tomb. I thought that was so interesting that they placed a seal. I started getting interested in what that meant and why, why does it describe this in the story? Why does this have such a prominent place? Well, the stone that was placed in front of Jesus' tomb was also sealed by the Roman authorities. This seal didn't have a lot of physical strength. It's just made out of soft, moldable clay, but it bore the seal of the Roman Empire. So they put the seal of the Roman Empire on top of this immovable stone. The seal was meant to get this, intimidate. The seal was meant to intimidate anyone who might think they were going to move that stone. This seal said, if you move this stone, you will suffer the empire's wrath. If you move this stone, there will be severe consequences. But I thank God that he's not limited by any 4,000-pound stone or any empire threatening to keep him from keeping his word. There is no stone. There is no intimidation. There was no lie. There is nothing that would stop God from doing what he promised his son and all of us he would do. It says in our story tonight in Matthew chapter 28 verses 2 through 4 that an angel showed up on the day that Jesus resurrected. That the the Lord sent this angel shining like lightning with thunder to move the stone and destroy the seal and shake the earth. This is a crazy moment in history, and I want you to know this is not the first earthquake that's taken place. There's some massive things that are taking place in the stars and the sky. There's massive things that are happening on the earth, and these are documented by external sources, not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but also people that lived in this era. They're saying, man, there was a day where the sun went dark for six hours in the middle of the day. It wasn't an eclipse. This was like nothing that had ever been seen before. The stars were visible at noontime there were earthquakes that opened up graves in this moment and it's all recorded for us so that we might recognize that something powerful and different than had ever happened before was taking place that stone was rolled away the immovable stone was rolled away and I love the message that I felt like the Lord wanted me to share with you about this it's this nothing is too hard for the Lord. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. That may be too hard for you. It may be too hard for a group of men. It may be too hard for the Roman Empire. But it's not too hard for the Lord. Jeremiah 32, 17 says something very basic, very powerful. Sovereign Lord, You made the heavens and earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. The creator of the universe had a plan that he was going to execute and nothing could stop him. No law of science, no group of soldiers, no stone that's 4,000 pounds was big enough to stop what God wanted to do. And I know 
sometimes we might think, okay, well, great, Mike, thank you for this. This is really powerful. I'm excited. What, what does that have to do with me? Well, I want you to think about the things that you can't move. There's some immovable obstacles in your life. Maybe it's labels that somebody's put on you. Maybe they told you you weren't smart enough, that you weren't qualified enough, that you would never amount to something. Maybe it's a prison cell that you put yourself in. Maybe it's physical, like I've been in a few of. Or maybe it's a prison cell of addiction, and you've been trying and trying thousands of times to quit. You've been promising yourself you're not going to go there anymore. You've been promising that you're not going to cross that line, but you cross that line again and again, and you find yourself in the same situations, and you know this is not something that I can do on my own. Maybe you've been praying, crying out for your husband or your wife or your daughter or your son or someone you just truly love. You've been praying for them with all your heart and you're crying out for God to move and it seems like they refuse to change. They won't do what you want them to do. They aren't willing to even come to church with you and you're feeling desperate. Like this is a a situation I cannot change. This is the situations that God specializes in. These are the things that are too hard for us to do. They're too difficult for you to move. But God can do anything. Someone say God can do anything. I got some immovable uh, obstacles in my life. In 2009, I was diagnosed with diabetes. They said, Mike, you have an incurable sickness. We have no modern medical procedure that can help you. There is no medicine that we can give you to cure this disease. There is no doctor on earth that can reverse or help you in any way. This is an immovable circumstance in my life, but I thank God for this. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. I may have walked with this sickness for 14 years, but I'll tell you what, there's coming a day where I'll stand on this stage and I'll tell you, my God healed me because nothing is too hard for the Lord. I'm not dependent on a medicine. I'm not dependent on a medical procedure. I'm not dependent on what a doctor says. I am dependent on the creator of the universe who has all power in his hand. Nothing's too difficult for him. The most immovable obstacles in our lives can be moved by God. The thing that is most impossible to be changed, that looks like it will never change, it can be changed by God. That's the first thing that that stone reveals to us. But I love the fact that the seal was broken. You see, the seal represents intimidation. The seal represents the enemy bringing lies. Saying, if you try to move this, I'm going to kill you. If you try to, if you even pray that this thing will be moved. I am going to bring all of my evil might against you. There's a a lying, intimidating spirit that's attached to a seal that's over that immovable obstacle in your life. Sometimes you wake up and all you can hear is that lying voice telling you you're not good enough, that you're never going to get out of debt, that you're always going to be in lack, that your family's never going to be saved, that you've done too much for anyone to love you, that you'll never be forgiven. And I'm here to tell you that there is a moment in history where all of those lies were put in their place. Not one bit of fear, not one bit of intimidation, not one bit of the things that the enemy had been declaring and boldly saying were going to take place took place. God had a plan to remove a stone and bring a savior out and nothing could stop it. No intimidation could stop it. I can remember a time in my life where I was very fearful. I was a believer. I had been raised in church and at, in my teenage years I wandered away from God. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. In my young adult years I finally came to a point where I knew I needed to rededicate my life to the Lord. And uh, I'm going to share more about that in a second. But I got into the full-time ministry. I was serving as an intern in a church where they were training me how to be a pastor. And I was really excited about what God was doing in my life. I've been serving now about one year, two years since I rededicated my life. And I got a call on a Sunday morning. Amazing things happen on Sunday mornings. I got a call on a Sunday morning, and it wasn't a good call. It was a call to let me know that my father had passed away. Now, I don't know if everyone knows my story as well. 
as I, I just share a little bit about my dad. My dad was one of the best dads ever when I was a kid. I loved him with all my heart. We used to play hide and seek. I can remember wrestling with him. I don't know if anybody else ever did this, but we used to play a game where I would punch him as hard as I could in his stomach, and he would pretend that really hurt him. But I had a great relationship with my dad. My dad was a Christian. He believed in God. He taught us to study the Bible, to, uh, to get ready for a, an amazing destiny in God. I can remember him talking about how we were going to do great things in the kingdom together. My dad actually went into the full-time ministry when I was uh, just approaching my preteen years. And I can remember going to different churches with him as he would preach and he would minister and he would activate people in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And all kinds of ra- really crazy, awesome stuff was taking place. And I, can, I was just drinking it in. I was excited. When I was 11 years old, my dad had an affair. He willfully started a sexual affair with another woman, and shortly thereafter, he started using drugs and alcohol, smoking cigarettes. I can remember going to his desk in his office and finding a pack of cigarettes and thinking, whoa, this is crazy. Never seen those things before in my life. And all of a sudden, my world shifted. I remember, you know, we had to leave. We had to go back home to my grandparents' home because my parents were getting a divorce. And I didn't see my dad very much after that. There was maybe two times I saw him as a teenager before I saw him finally just a few short weeks after this phone call where they let me know he's dead. My dad had died of a drug overdose in a hotel room all by himself. 18 years or more of addiction, alcohol abuse, a life that most people would be ashamed to live. And I don't know what his final moments are. I pray, I pray still to this day that he had a moment to say, I repent, God forgive me. But when I returned home from seeing my dad laying dead in the mortuary, having died of an overdose in the middle of nowhere, this fear began to grip my heart. I was a Christian, I was a believer, I've been serving God faithfully in the ministry for almost two years, and I was wrapped up in a fear that I cannot express to you. You see, something inside of me just kept telling me, you're going to be just like your dad. It doesn't matter how much you serve God, you're going to end up just like him. It doesn't matter that you've surrendered and given him everything, you're going to end up like your father. There's going to come a day where you backslide and you fall away and you're going to end up just like him, all alone, dead, with no impact and no legacy. And that fear was gripping me. And I don't know if you guys have ever dealt with fear like this. It comes and goes. There's times where it feels like you can't think about anything else. And then there's times where it's just a a weird little buzz in the back of your head. But this went on for months until one day I got up on a Sunday morning. (laughs) I woke up like Pastor does about 2.30 in the morning and I got in my car and I drove to a beach and I opened up my Bible. (laughs) And I'll never forget this moment. I opened my Bible and turned to the reading for that day and I found myself in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10. I read Isaiah 46, and when I read verse 10, something changed inside of my heart. It says this, I will be your God throughout your lifetime until your hair is white with age. I made you, and I will care for you. I will carry you along and save you. I want to talk to you about the power of the risen Savior. Because all of a sudden in that moment, I recognized it wasn't about how well I could do. It wasn't about how many ministries I was involved with. It wasn't about how many days I'd been serving at the church. It had nothing to do with anything that I could accomplish. It had everything to do with what Jesus could accomplish and what he had already done to set me free. And God was saying, don't worry, I'm going to give you the strength you need. I love this quote from Andrew Murray, one of the most famous preachers on prayer. He said this, a dead Christ I must do everything for. A living Christ does everything for me. Jesus paid the price that I could never pay. He did what I could never do so that I can walk with him all the days of my life until my hair is gray. I don't have to worry. I don't have to be afraid. He has the power to carry you to the very end. 
He's not just a savior, he's the keeping savior. Now I've got a promise from God that he's going to keep me. I love Jude. One chapter in that book, it says in verse 24 that he's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. I love that promise from our risen Savior that Jesus is going to do what I could never do for myself. That's truth number one. The stolen is rolled away. Truth number two. The tomb is empty. Matthew chapter 28, verse 6, the angel speaking to the women says, He isn't here. He has risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. Now, Mary, and, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went looking for Jesus in the tomb where his body had been laid, but they had forgotten what he said. They were looking for Jesus in a place that he could not be found, a place where he would never be found again. I'm reminded of those teenage years I mentioned to you where I began to wander further and further away from God. As a young adult, I went to a college that was notorious for partying and became a drug abusing, alcohol abusing, angerholic. I've been arrested more than one time because I couldn't control my anger, thrown on the curb with handcuffs in my, around my hands, around my wrists, because I couldn't control my mouth or my anger. I was bound in every sense of the word. And I didn't have any life inside of me, and I can Hello? I was looking for life, for hope, for something in places that had nothing to offer. Like Mary and Mary, I was showing up to empty tombs looking for something that could give me something that, that could help me feel better about my life, about the choices that I made, and I was recognizing that everywhere I went, that that was empty. The sports didn't matter. I was captain of the football team, captain of the wrestling team. I did not have any joy from that. I was in the cool crowd. People liked me. I didn't feel any joy from that. I used all the drugs and the alcohol they told me to, and I had sex outside of marriage and all the different things that people say, this is going to really give you joy. And, and, and I didn't find any joy in that, and I kept thinking, I must be doing this wrong because some of these people look like they're having fun, but I'm miserable doing this. I was going to an empty tomb looking for something that was not ever there to begin with. Like Mary and Mary, are you looking for peace? I was looking for peace, but the Bible says he is our peace who has broken down every wall. Are you looking for life? It's the Bible says Jesus tells us I am the way, the truth, and the life. Are you looking for hope? The Bible says he is our hope. My question for you tonight is are you looking for all that hope and that life and that peace in the wrong places? Are you looking at empty tombs that don't have any power to help you or assist you? Because the hope that God promises comes from a resurrected Savior, not a dead one. You're not going to find it in that tomb. You're only going to find it in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. He's not in the tomb anymore. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's interceding even now. He's praying that you'll stop looking for him in all those wrong places. He's praying that you'll meet him today, just as he promised. That brings me to the end of the story. I love what the angel said to the women. He said, just as he said. Just as he said. I don't know if he had an attitude when he said, I can imagine him. Like, don't you remember what he said? <laughs> he ain't here. He's risen just like he said. Hello? <laughs> See, Jesus had already promised them that on the third day he was going to rise. Let's go back a little bit. Matthew chapter 17. This is like 10 chapters earlier. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's making it very plain here, people. After they gathered again in Galilee, Jesus told them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. And the disciples were filled with grief. You see, I think the grief and the sorrow of losing Jesus caused them to miss one of his most important promises, that he would live again. No matter how painful the circumstances of your life may seem or how impossible the odds are that are stacked against you, if God said it, you can believe it. I love this quote 
The resurrection gives my life meaning and direction and the opportunity to start over no matter what my circumstances. Robert Flatt, what am I saying? I'm saying this. Jesus always keeps his promises. He always keeps his word. He has never said something and not done it. Look at Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. He has, has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? The answer to that question in this Bible verse is this. No, God has never lied. He has never failed to act. He has never failed to fulfill his promise. He always does what he says he will do. If he said it, we can believe it. Luke 137 says it very plainly. For the word of God will never fail. It will never fail. Wow. Now I've shared this story before, but I'll share it again because I believe it has something for somebody in this room tonight. Because I think there's some people that came into this church like I did 15 plus years ago. I was a mess. I mentioned I was on trial for assault. I was a drug addict. I was alcoholic. I was an anger driven man. I was controlled by rage. I walked into the church and I wish I could say I came, you know, thinking that I was going to fulfill some great destiny. That's not why I came to church. I literally came to church because I was so broken and so lost. I was just hoping that I might find some people that weren't maybe drinking on the weekends. Every friend I had was taking me to a place I never want to go again. Every time I went out on Friday promising myself that I wasn't going to get drunk, that I wasn't going to get high, that I wasn't going to get angry, I did. And I got so lost that I finally said, you know what, I think I remember my family told me about church, about a God who loves me. And I, I remember there were some good people in that church. There were some bad ones too. But I can remember a few Good people, and maybe I could find some good people to hang out with. That was my only, my highest aspiration as I walked in the doors of the church. But something began to shift inside of me as I sat in that room with the worship and I listened to the messages that were going forward. And I remember the pastor sharing this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And something inside of me just jumped for joy. You see, I've been looking in all the wrong places, all those empty tombs, trying to find life and joy and peace. And suddenly I recognized in this promise from God that the very thing that I had been looking for was in God's plan. That it was always his intention to give me the joy and the life and the peace and the hope and the future. That he had a plan for me that was good and not evil. But part of me still doubted. I, I didn't know. I, you know, at five years old, I... I can remember telling my grandma that I'm going to be a preacher someday. But I'll tell you what, I didn't feel like a preacher that day. On trial for assault, telling me God's going to use me? I don't think so. But something inside of me dared to hope, dared to believe that that plan that God had for me was still valid. That he still had a good future for me. And so I raised my hand and, I, and as the team around me was worshiping and people were singing, I don't know what they were singing, but I raised my hands and I said, God, I'm going to surrender my life to your plan. Whatever you want me to do, however you want me to live, I'm going to do that. And I'll tell you what, I was surrounded by the love of God in a way that is so real that I can't even adequately express what I felt and experienced in that. But it didn't stop there because in my heart of hearts, I could feel God saying this, the plan has not changed. I'm still going to use you. I'm still going to make you a preacher. And I couldn't believe it, but I was excited and, and ready for that moment. You know, God's taken me to more than 30 countries now to preach the gospel. I've had the opportunity to share with people the story of my life and see God time and time again use that to change people's hearts. Not because I'm so great, not because I've got it all figured out, not because I did the right things, but because there is a risen Savior who paid the price, who, who had all the power that God had, brought to bear in one moment, shut, th threw a stone aside, broke the seal, and stepped out into a, a world that wasn't even ready for this incredible Savior. And I met him, and he changed my life, and he made me into something I could never be without him. The last point is he is waiting. I love when the angel says to them, 
Go quickly, verse 7, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. Remember what I've told you. I think he knew they had a little bit of a short-term memory problem. <laughs> he says, remember this. Go to Galilee and meet Jesus like he promised you. You see, before Jesus went to the cross, before he laid his life down for his disciples and for all of us in this room, he established a meeting point for them. He established an appointment. He said, hey, guys, um, you're all going to abandon me. And every one of them said, no, no, we're not, we're not going to abandon you, Jesus, of course not. We would never do that. He said, yeah, you're, you're going to leave. You're going to be scattered. You're going to abandon me at the hour that I most need you. He talked to Peter about it. He said, Peter, you know, the devil wants to sift you. He wants to test you, and you need to pray. You need to get ready. But Peter was too tired to pray. And Jesus knew that at his worst moment, at the moment where he would need love and support probably more than ever in his life, that his closest friends, the guys that he had walked with for three years were going to run away. They were going to leave him. They were going to abandon him. And he was going to be left to die a sinner's death on a cross all by himself, even at that point abandoned and forsaken by his father because he had become sin for us. But Jesus made an appointment with those disciples. He said, look, I see all that is going to go wrong. I see all the failures. I see all the mistakes. But get ready. When I raise up out of that grave, I'm going to meet you. We're going to meet together in Galilee, and I'm going I'm to restore you. I'm going to remind you of the call that's on your life. He knew that they would fail, but he made provision for their forgiveness and their reconciliation even before they failed. I love this about God. You know, the Bible I mentioned, it shares so much incredible insight about God. God says this in Psalm 139 that all of our days are in his book. Another way of saying that is God saw your whole life before you even lived one day. He knew every day that you were going to live. It says in another place that he sees the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. It means God is not bound by time. He knows everything. And I love that truth about God because that means that he saw me at my worst day. He saw you when you failed beyond repair. He saw you when you were at your lowest moment. And just like Jesus looking at the disciples saying, I know you're about to have one of your lowest moments ever. God made a way for you to be forgiven. God made a way for you to be restored. God made a way for you to be reconciled to him, to have the relationship that you long for, so that his plan for your good and his plan for a future could be made right and real in your life. But it comes back to meeting him. It comes back to the same appointment that's here for you today. Do you understand that Jesus is still waiting? to meet with you, that he saw May 22nd, 2024 on the, the book of your life and he was saying, this is the day that I'm going to meet with you. This is the day I'm going to restore you. This is the day that all that mistake, all those sins, all those failures are going to be washed away because I've got the power to do it. I'm the risen Savior. I rose up out of that grave to prove to you that I'll never fail on my promise. I'll never give up on what I told you I'll do. But you gotta meet with me. You gotta come to me. You gotta meet Jesus today. This is the promise I told you at the beginning that this risen Savior can have an impact on your today and your forever. That if you'll meet with Jesus, if you'll surrender your life like I did and say, hey, the plan you have sounds good. Let me use that plan. Let's live that plan out. I'm ready to go wherever you want me to go. I'm ready to give my life so that I can experience what you have, that power that brought you out of the grave. You know, the Bible says that same power can be in you if you'll just believe. And so I'm going to give an invitation tonight to every single person in the room to meet with Jesus, to experience what I've experienced. I was a mess, I was a failure, I knew. And I was just like those disciples that left Jesus high and dry, I had walked away from him. 
There was no reason that God should love me anymore, but for some reason, he still did. And the love of God is still on display in this story. That he would send his son to, to die a sinner's death for you. He lived a perfect life, but he died a sinner's death. He paid the price that we could never pay. The Bible says that the wages of our sins, of our failures, is death. And Jesus took that death on himself. He went into a grave. They put a stone in front of him. They sealed it. And they expected that he'd never rise again. But Jesus had promised, I'm going to get up out of that grave. Why? So that you would know that what he did on that cross was for you. And that power that raised him out of the grave is available today to save you from your sins from the wages of sin, that is death. The Bible defines death as eternal separation from God. And I don't probably have to describe how far you feel from God when you're living in sin. How far he seems away, how far you feel from the love and the life and the peace that he has to offer. That's what that death that begins in this life and then carries on to eternity. You're eternally separated from that life, from that hope, from that peace if you don't choose to meet with Jesus. If you don't choose like I did to say I surrender, I want, I want your plan, I want what you have for me, Jesus. I'm gonna, I'm gonna welcome that power that raised you from the dead to raise me up out of the death that I'm in, out of the sin that I'm in right now. And to let his sacrifice, his life poured out, his blood wash you clean today and so right now I want to give you the opportunity to meet Jesus I want to invite our ushers our altar team to come forward this is an opportunity for you to meet the risen Savior he's been waiting some of you know he's been speaking to your heart all night long you know God's calling you you know he's been saying this is your moment this is it don't let it pass you by you don't know what's gonna happen when you walk out these doors I'm sure that my dad had good intentions of turning it around one day. In fact, I talked to him about it shortly before he died. He said, maybe I'll come back to church someday. Six weeks later, he was dead of an overdose. Don't walk out of here and miss your appointment. Jesus set it up. He's established it. Today's the day, May 22nd, 2024. This is your day. So on the count of three. If you want to meet with Jesus, you want to surrender your life to him, you want to experience the life, the joy, the peace that only he has. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Let me see those hands. Let me see your hands. I see those hands. I see your hands. I see you. I see you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Anyone else? I see your hand at the back. Let's all stand to our feet. I don't want to want, invite those of you who just raised your hands to come forward for this appointment. There's prayer warriors, there's leaders, there's altar leaders here. They're going to pray with you. Would you give us the privilege and honor of praying with you as you meet with Jesus today? Would you give us the, the honor of being there as you get set free from the wages of sin and walk into a new life of hope and joy and peace with him? Would you give them a round of applause as they come, guys? Come on. Let's get excited about sinners coming home to Jesus, about people getting set free in this place, a meeting with a risen Savior. Awesome. Awesome. So proud of you guys. Come on, guys. They're still coming. They're still coming. Give them a round of applause. Let's clap. We're excited to have you join this family. Amen. Awesome. Hey, if I could have your attention for everybody that just responded, for all my, my people that just came up, proud of you guys. If I could have your attention just a second. This is the most important day of your life, right? This is it. This is the moment you've been waiting for. This is the moment you've been waiting for. A moment where Jesus is going to change everything. And guess what? If you're like me, the first thing I said after I got saved is, what now? How do I do this? What do I do next? We got discipleship classes. Pastor Marco mentioned them. Holy Warriors is starting in a couple weeks. You're going to talk with these people. They're going to pray with you. But don't miss your next step. Your next step is to get water baptized, to be a part of those classes, and to experience a change of your life that you've been longing for. All right? 
So let's pray together. You guys ready to pray? We're going to pray. I want you to repeat this after me. Jesus, thank you for paying the price that I could never pay. Thank you for living a perfect life, for dying on the cross for me, and for raising up out of that grave. I give you my life. I surrender my all. I'm going to live for you. I want the plan you have. However you want me to live, that's how I'm going to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you give these guys a round of applause?